Hey, thanks for pressing play on this episode of the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. A nostalgic look back at my favorite Rangers from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I'm your host, Tom Browning. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in and welcome to another episode of the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. I'm your host, Tom Browning. I want to wish Happy New Year to everybody. And to start the new year, I'd like to do something a little bit different. Uh, As you all know, the whole concept behind the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway is to talk about my favorite New York Rangers from the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. And of course, the game has changed uh, quite a bit since, uh, since that time. And It's with great pleasure that I have a special guest with me today. He's also my son. His name is Mike Browning. And Mike, uh, also a diehard Ranger fan, moved to the West Coast a few years ago and has his own show with his friend Steve Fishman, excuse me, uh, called The the Fish Tank. And they talk Sharks hockey on KMBR, uh, which is this all sports uh, talk show station out in San Francisco. So, what I'd like to do today is uh, talk uh, with Mike about his ideas, his feelings about the state of the game today, the way the game is played, and of course, I'll be a counter to that. I'd like to talk about how I preferred the game, the way it was played back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my son, Mike Browning. And Mike, if you can just tell me a little bit about the show that you and Steve has have um, called The Fish Tank. And then, uh, you know, just go into how you feel the game is played today and some of your thoughts about the players in general. Sure, yeah. Um, I work in tech out in the the Bay Area, but uh, my buddy Steve is a producer at KMBR, and he was starting a podcast um, on the Sharks They to fill a little niche that they needed on their site. And, um, you know, as one of the few uh, diehard hockey fans that he knew um, out there in the West Coast, he invited me to start the show with him. And... um, it worked out really well. It's right down the street from my office. We get together on Mondays, do the show, um, you know, post it to the KMBR site, and uh, be getting a lot of traction. So, look, turns out there's a lot more hockey fans than we thought out in the West Coast and, um, you know, San Francisco, East Bay, and uh, San Jose. So, you know, the Sharks have a larger following than you might think. And, um, you know, they've been p- tuning in, and it's been really successful so far. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I've listened to your podcast, of, of course, and. You've covered some of the old old time players, and the game has changed. Um, really, I think the big the biggest difference between now and then is just it's just goaltending. It's better goaltending, larger pads. The butterfly style has ushered in. Really, it's ushered in the dead puck era. Um, the goalies are closing off entire sections of the net, um, and you know some of the best athletes are playing goalies now, you know, the goalie used to be kind of the, the secondary position. Um, but now, you know, instead of playing uh, as a skater, some of the best athletes are deciding to play goalie as, as kids. And, um, you know, so you're getting goalies now that are more athletic than ever before. Um, really, um, mastering the butterfly style, moving laterally quicker than they ever have, um, closing off, you know, like I said, entire sections of the net. So there's less space to shoot at. Um, so you're never going to see another kind of 180, 190 point season like you used to have in the Wayne Gretzky era, where goalies were um, a little less athletic, smaller pads, did not use the butterfly style, um, used the stand up style. So there was a lot more net to shoot at. Um, but at the same time, the fact that it's harder to score means that you need more skill to score. Um, so as a result, I think um, whether it's passively or directly, you're seeing less fighting. And that's a result of needing more guys in your roster with skill. So there's not as many um, roster spaces for guys who can't really score anymore and just fight. So you're seeing kind of the goon, um, you're seeing kind of the goon position um, go by the wayside. Guys who aren't the most skilled guys, but go out there to really brawl and defend their teammates. Um, You know, whether or not that is, um, you know, important is a different discussion, but uh, the fact that you need more skill in the lineup is, is, you know, ushering in a new age where these guys are kind of obsolete. So that's the reason why you're seeing less fighting majors than ever before, uh, fewer penalty minutes than ever before. And um, it's really the infusion of skill and the the, uh, result of better goaltending than ever before. Um, You're also seeing a greater infusion of European players. So there's just a larger talent pool worldwide. You're seeing more ch- players from the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Finland, Sweden, um, even lesser known hockey countries like Germany and, and um, the Ukraine. You're seeing guys come from all over the world. So the, the talent pool is larger, meaning 
there's of course more skill. Not only that, um, you know, the hockey, the hockey kind of uh, world order is changing. So you're seeing countries like Sweden, Finland, and the United States starting to challenge kind of Russia, uh, Canada's superiority. Russia too, um, they're ch- starting to challenge Canada's superiority as well. You're seeing guys, you know, NHL superstars come from other countries, come from countries all over the world. Um, so, like I said, it, the, the talent pool is larger, and you're getting more talented guys. Um, you know, Sweden right now is is writing the book on on how to play defense. Uh, some of the best defensemen in the world and uh, are, are from Sweden. Some of the best defensemen are coming through um, the the Swedish system, um, and that's kind of changing the look of the game as well. So that's really those are the main things that off the top of my head that I think are changing the game now. It's uh, you know more skill, less better goaltending, less less of a need for um, for goons. Um, obviously, of course, getting rid of the, the red line and and the two line pass um, is also opening up the game a little bit and giving it a, a little bit of a better look, less passing, more guys carrying the puck uh, through the zone. So those are the main things that I see. No, I, I agree, uh, Mike. I think that uh, the athlete today is uh, definitely more skilled, uh, better conditioned, and I think the coaching techniques have have greatly improved. And I think the schemes that they use. Uh, have improved, especially defensively uh, in the National Hockey League today. Uh, I, I agree with you, your, your contention that goaltending is uh, definitely you know better today. I think is evidence of that. Back in the 1980s, there were only two goaltenders who played in the 80s who made the Hall of Fame, as Grant Fuhr and Billy Smith. But I think back then uh, the goaltending style was different. You know, you had more diminutive players playing that position because the game required more reflexes. Uh, it, it was more of a stand-up style. So like you said, there was more net exposed. So the players, the goalies, actually depended on the quickness, their agility, of and using their limbs to make the save, whether it be the, the glove save or the, the, the kick save, was, was very, very big back in the day. The goalies were taught to follow the puck. Uh, they weren't taught to butterfly down and to cover as much net as possible. Now with the goalies being so big, very rarely do you see a goaltender that's uh, less than six feet tall today, and the pads are two times, three times the size. I mean, now goalies wear shoulder pads like linebackers. Back in the day, you could barely tell if a goaltender was wearing shoulder pads, and you know the, the goalie pads were like uh, overstuffed um, upholstery. You know, it was uh, it was small in comparison. So uh, I don't agree that the athleticism necessarily was any different. I think uh, the goalies were very, very quick back then. They're very nimble. But it's a different style of, of, of game, and you're right. The ath- there's probably better athletes playing goalie, but there's also a different style that is really making it more difficult for goal, uh, goal scorers to score. Now, goalies uh, players try to score by moving the goalies left to right, by getting them to uh, go from uh, the left post to the right post or vice versa. Uh, through passing down low, where back in the day you could uh, it wasn't un, un, uh, unheard of to have a uh, uh, slap shots uh, without any screens beat the goaltender just based on sh- the sheer velocity of, of the shot, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, I, I think the game today uh, to me is a little bit more vanilla. It's not as exciting as it was back in the day, and, and the reason why I feel that way is that um, there was more players and teams were more identifiable back then. There was more flamboyancy with the players. First of all, you didn't have everyone wearing helmets. So you could actually notice the player by their physical characteristics, by the way they looked, by the way they wore their hair. Even skating styles, I think, were more personal back then. Today, everyone is taught the same way how to skate. There's uh, there's definite fundamentals on, on, on skating. And uh, it's more robotic. Back in the day, people actually, players actually imparted their own personality, their own idiosyncrasies in the way they skated. And the fact that they were more identifiable, I felt cr- players were more creative, whether it be the Phil Esposito style or the Bobby Orr's or, you know, the Gila Flores. I mean, guys you could identify from a great distance. Uh, they they, they seem to have more of a, more of identifiable characteristics. Even teams had their own culture. You know, whether it be the Broad Street Bullies, where everyone was tough on the team but could play hockey, the Big Bad Bruins, or the Flying Frenchmen, or the Montreal Canadiens. They all had a unique, identifiable character that identi- that made the team very unique, which I thought was very exciting. I, I think it brought more anticipation to the, to the game because you know a team that was coming in, the way they played, uh, it just seemed like it was less vanilla 
and more exciting than uh, th- than today. Um, so I don't know. Even the crowd. I'm back in the day. Madison Square Garden was electric. Even during warmups. Today it seems to be more diluted. The Philadelphia Flyer fans were known for their being very boisterous. The Boston Bruin fans. Uh, today the crowd seems to be very. They don't seem to have unique characteristics. Uh, you got a lot of piped in music, and it, it just doesn't seem to be as spontaneous as it was back in the day. So I don't know. I think uh, the game has, well, the athletes are better. They're better coached. The players are a lot faster, a lot stronger. I think if you took those same players back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s and brought them into today's training regimens and today's style of hockey, you'd still have those top-notch players from that era back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s still be your top-notch players today because they were still the best athletes. But I think the game with the, with the with the goal scoring, um, the more offense. Um, you didn't have the trap. You didn't have the the one two two trap or the one three one trap, where players were forced to go up the sideboards. And you know today, uh, back in the day, the wingers picked up their man, and there was a lot more room through the neutral zone. You'd see the end to end rushes with Bobby Orr with Bobby Hull and. Uh, it just seems like the game was more wide open. There wasn't as much uh, attention paid to defense. The transition game was really the focus of attention. Um, so I don't know. Uh, obviously, I've seen both eras. Unfortunately, the, mil- the millennials today are only seeing the game from the lens that you know they're seeing it from the last 5, 10, 15 years. So you know, I, I hate to be that guy who says, oh, back in the day, it was better than it is now. But I don't know. I think if you hear Phil Esposito talk recently in a recent interview, he thinks the game was a lot better back then because of the reasons I stated. There was just more team culture, more identifiable players, more excitement. Uh, There wasn't, uh, offense wasn't as stifling. The defense wasn't as stifling. Uh, Knee pads and shin pads weren't meant to block shots. They were meant to uh, be able to tolerate a slash or getting hit with the puck, but not for blocking shots. So now, in in essence, you've got five five or six goaltenders on the ice just based on the the sheer size of the shin pads alone. And uh, the art of the blocking shot that was brought in by Tortorella wasn't prevalent back then. You know, it's just a... Just a different uh, type of game. But, um, you know, what are your thoughts to that? I agree with a lot of it. Um, You know, in terms of the NHL and and hockey players being, you know, a little bit vanilla, a little bit boring, I couldn't agree more. But I don't know what it is. I don't know why the hockey culture is that way. Um, Hockey players are, um, you know, taught to be uh, hyper humble. They're not, you know, t- taught to, to draw attention to themselves in any way off the ice. Um, they're always giving, you know, they're taught to give credit to their teammates, their coaches, but never themselves. Um, and, and, and you know what? It's a nice idea, but ultimately it's boring. And the NHL does the same way. They, uh, for some reason, they refuse to market their players. They have great big personalities in a league, but they, but they refuse to highlight them. Um, they refuse to do anything that's, um, you know, that, that could be construed as flamboyant or ruffle feathers for whatever reason. And the result is a really vanilla product, and it's it's hard to catch on beyond uh, kind of the the typical hardcore hockey fan, and th- therefore the NHL has never really caught on be- beyond being that cult status that it is now, that uh, that fourth fiddle in the pantheon of uh, of American major sports. So I agree. For whatever reason, hockey decides that it wants to be boring. Um, so if you don't like the product on the ice um, that, that you're seeing or if you're not familiar with the sport, it's very hard to catch on. So I agree that it was a little bit more exciting back then. But, um, you know, in terms of the fans, you know, that's just the, the day the day we're living in. You know, that's the that's that's the age we're living in. Um, I think across all sports, it's it's the same way. Um, the, t- the ticket prices are higher, meaning it's a more exclusive experience. F- fewer people can go. Um, there's more security. Everything in, is, is watered down. Um, there's more regulations. You can't do what you used to do with the stadium. Um, you'll get kicked out. They try to kind of enforce a more family-oriented um, experience. So you're not going to have this, the same rowdy uh, atmosphere that you used to have. 
but you know that it's each their own. I, you know, some people are fine with that. You know, that you, you're probably happy that you'll you'll feel more comfortable bringing your family to the game than you used to. You know, in the garden back then, where you know a fight might break out next to you and you might catch a stray punch or something like that. So you shouldn't have to worry about that when you go to a hockey game. So I mean, that's just the, that's just the day we're living in across all all sports. But in terms of the talent level, like I said, I I, I kind of don't disagree with you there. The talent pool is much larger, and I I, I don't doubt that a lot of the Hall of Famers that played back then would be Hall of Famers today as well. I don't doubt that for a second, but think about it. Back then, you wouldn't have guys like Alexander Ovechkin who really revolutionized the game, and not to mention was one of the you know more outsized personalities in a game that's kind of watered down and vanilla, like I mentioned. So you wouldn't have guys like that back then. You wouldn't have Andrzej Kobitar from Slovenia. Uh, you wouldn't have Henrik Lundqvist from Sweden necessarily, you know, not as many Swedes back then made the jump to the NHL. So the talent pool is just much larger, you know, so for for what it's worth. So, I, you know, I, I agree that, you know, there are many aspects of the game that could improve that were be- better back then. But I think the talent pool now is larger. I think some of the things that made the game back then so great in terms of, you know, the atmosphere, the player personalities, uh, the fan personalities, that's just never going to happen again. That was you know, that, that just, it's, it's not possible in this day and age. So that's just kind of going to be a legend that people who experienced the game back then are always going to be able to talk about, but I don't think it could ever be replicated in today's society. So, you know, that's just, it's a different era now. So it's a more family friendly era, but, um, you know, I agree that the game has a, could, can do a lot to improve in terms of marketing itself and being more appealing to people that aren't already hardcore fans. There's a lot of good personalities in the game right now that the NHL should be marketing because you know in my opinion the the athletes are better there is a larger talent pool and they're and they're better conditioned so the product can be better than it's ever been uh, I think it's just on the NHL to to market it that way uh, those are good points Mike but I, I I gotta wonder with today's media exposure cable TV if any of the entertainer Shaq who played for the Rangers Maple Leafs Pittsburgh Penguins uh, Dave Tiger Williams Dave Schultz uh, Derek Sanderson's. I I gotta wonder. I just if they were playing today, just how big they would be in today's sport. I mean, um, you know, even Brett Hull, who played in the '80s, probably today, he, being so outspoken the way he was, uh, he would probably be uh, one of the dominant figures in the sport today. But uh, it just seems like there were so many more colorful personalities. But but if he but even back then, when you talk to the players off the ice, those Canadian players who played back in the '60s, '70s, and '80s, they still uh, were as humble back then as they as the players were today when you did interviews off the ice for the most part you know it's, it was just that personality that they brought on to the ice that seems to be the, so much different you know uh, than it is today but um, you know I want to thank you for shedding your insights on uh, your view on today's player and um, I just want to end the podcast with give me a real quick feeling about today's New York Ranger team where do you think they're heading this season and just a quick update on the Sharks where do you think their prospects are going forward uh, before we wrap this uh, podcast up I think the Rangers and Sharks are teams going in completely different directions Uh, the Rangers are in trouble they are um, they have they have a talented team but the way that they're deployed and coached is seriously hamstringing them Um, they are bleeding shots against they are playing horrendous defense, and they're being held afloat by Henrik Lundqvist. And, you know, as he gets older, he's going to, you know, it's going to be harder and harder for him to do that. So, you know, I think Henrik Lundqvist has covered up a lot of warts on this team over the years. Um, and, you know, I think they do have talent, but the way that they're they're used and, they're, and deployed by Elaine Vigneault is going to culminate in a really ugly second half of the season. Um, and if they're lucky enough to make the playoffs, it's going to be an early exit. Meanwhile, the Sharks are on the on the rise. They have some young guys um, that are starting to really contribute. Timo Mayer, Kevin LeBanc, those guys are starting to really roll. Meanwhile, their their veterans like Joe Thornton and uh, Pavelski are starting to really hit their stride. It took them a little while to get going this year. Um, they have an immense talent on defense. Um, they have immense talent up front. Their goaltending is a little shaky. Uh, Martin Jones is probably an average goaltender at best, but um, they've been getting incredible backup goaltending by Aaron Dell this year. So as far as I'm concerned, they're a major threat 
to come out of the Western Conference for the Stanley Cup playoffs, especially as, uh, in my opinion, the Vegas Golden Knights will, will soon come back to, down to earth. So, you know, they might make a serious run for finishing first at the Pacific and then making a serious run at the Stanley Cup. Meanwhile, the Rangers, I think, are uh, going to have some real problems in the second half of the year. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, the Sharks also have one of the best coaches in the league in Pete DeBoer. I think uh, uh, that is definitely uh, an advantage, too, for the Sharks. And all, all, also the points that you mentioned before, as far as the Rangers go, I think they're going to be uh, victimized again by their lack of offense, by the l- lack of a game-breaker, a clutch goal scorer, which seems to be, the, you know, the case with this team for the last 10 years or so. Uh, defensively, I think they are, like you said, they're prone to mistakes. They get very disorganized. Uh, they're not as disciplined defensively. And I'm still, I still have a question about Lundqvist in a big spot. To me, he always seems to give up the last goal of a game in, in, the, in, in the playoffs in a tough situation. But he's having a great regular season like he usually does. And I think uh, if they do make the playoffs, it'll be because of Henrik Lundqvist. But Mike, I want to thank you uh, for joining me today. It's been a privilege and honor to have my boy with me doing this podcast. I know you fly out to California today, and I guess you'll be doing your Sharks uh, podcast with uh, Steve Fishman, uh, The Fish Tank on KNBR Radio. Uh, I guess you'll be cutting the next program this coming Monday. And uh, I look forward to getting back to the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway, selecting a player from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And I'll be uh, producing that show probably sometime early next week. So I want to thank uh, Mike again, and I thank you folks for, for tuning in. Once again, this has been the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. I'm your host, uh, Tom Browning. Thank you for listening. This has been a Go Tommy Boy production.